Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Bridge. I'm your host, Kira Young, and you've reached me on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. And of course, we're simulcasting tonight with Real Liberty Media. So you can check us out any any of those places. And if you don't already know, Revolution Radio has a phone number that you can call. So when you don't have access to internet or a computer, you can always call that number and listen to the show. You never have to miss The Bridge with Kira, ever. It is the 10th of December, 2016, a little after four in the afternoon Eastern time. And we have another No Dapple show for you. The theme is it's not over. So much has happened this week um, and we're gonna get into it. Uh, We're gonna get into the weeds a little bit and uh, figure out and speculate a little bit about some of the things that have been going on behind the scenes. Uh, So please stick around. The first hour, I have Linda Black Elk, and the second hour, we have Tashina Sapawi. So these are two powerful warrior women that have been right there on the front lines from the very beginning. Um, So they're able to share a perspective with us about the entire arc of this uh, Standing Rock movement. One of the things that I would like to clarify about Standing Rock is Standing Rock is it is the current expression of a very long resistance indigenous resistance so um, we'll be having our own after action reports um, amongst ourselves when it's all over and we will continue to resist and we will take what we learn from this experience and um, move into other areas and keep fighting this um, big oil. Standing Rock has lifted the veil on big oil entitlement. They expected to just bully, they bully their way through Indian country, lay down a pipeline without all the proper permits, with no environmental impact study, and um, the native people were just supposed to roll over and take it. And that's not what happened this time. And they're very angry about that. So, um, you know, that's, that's something I want to clarify right, right then and there. This is not over in many ways. It's not over in Standing Rock. And it's the struggle's not over by any stretch. And we should, we should not allow ourselves to, um, to poo-poo. <laughs> the amazing things that have come out of this and the, the incredible uh, organization that had to come together <clears throat> to make this happen. Um, all movements are co-opted, all of them, because we live under oligarchy and we live under um, empire and the psychopaths are in charge. So. Um, as this becomes co-opted, we move on and the resistance takes another form. But it's always, always about our freedom. And not just freedom for indigenous people, but for everyone. So let me, let me get Linda here on the phone and we will get into it. And I thank everybody for tuning in. Hello. Hi, Linda. Welcome to the bridge. Hi, how are you? I'm wonderful. Welcome back, in fact. It's been a while since you were on and and since we met. And so much has happened. So much has happened. I'm so honored to be back on. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, This week was huge. Um, There was 
from Sunday, I guess it was Sunday where the where the big announcement was wa- was made. The easement's not granted, you know, and everybody celebrated and woo. And then it was like, oh wait a minute, yeah, yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> Not quite as much to celebrate as what we originally might have thought. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I can't say that I was really fooled even from the beginning. You know, I I was happy. I do consider it to be a minor victory, um, but I consider it more to be the U.S. government stalling and even maybe trying to get a lot of people to leave, uh, making people become complacent. That is basically what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And my opinion about uh, Chairman Archambo is, uh, you know, people are, are very upset saying, you know, he took a deal, he took money. And, and I, I really don't think that's what happened. I think that the deal he made was to make was to tell people to leave in exchange for them not granting the easement. I think it's kind of as simple as that. It, it could definitely be that. Um, you know, I know uh, Dave personally, and I think he's a very good person, and I think he really wants what's best for his people. Um, but, you know, I think that sometimes, as, um, uh, you know, politics is politics, and a lot of leaders sometimes feel like they have to do things in order to protect their people, even if it's not necessarily what their people want, because uh, the vast majority of people on Standing Rock are telling us as water protectors to stay. Mm. Um, they're telling people, you know, this, this fight isn't over. We've been warned of that numerous times. Uh, Dakota Access themselves have come forward, Energy Transfer Partners and Dakota Access have come forward and said basically that they don't plan on stopping. Um, and so, you know, while I'm not sure if they are drilling as we speak, I'm sure they plan on continuing. Uh, did, did you hear that um, a judge, uh, so, Energy Transfer Partners uh, approached the government and asked them to make a very quick decision in overturning the Corps' decision, Mm -hmm. blocking the Corps' decision. Um, This judge basically said, nope, too bad. We're not going to make any decision on this until the end of January. And you shouldn't have, um, uh, uh, you know, basically completed a pipeline without all the proper permits. Right. So, yes. So there's that. Um, yeah. So we're just kind of, you know, I, I think we're kind of in limbo right now. You know, the feeling mm-hmm. in camp today is one of, you know, okay, what's going to happen next? What should we do next? Um, and, you know, what's going to happen? There are, there's actually a lot of leaders from the local area who want to see people stay on the land so that we can reclaim it as part of the Ocheti Shakoni according to the Treaty of Fort Laramie, of course, 1851. Mm-hmm. So I think that that, is, that that might very well be the next move for the camp. There's a lot of rumors going around. We're not sure if they're true. A lot of people are saying, oh, the Corps is going to flood the camp. Um, that would serve two purposes, according to these rumors. They're saying that it would, number one, prevent Dakota access from drilling, and it would also get people to leave the Ocheti Shakoni camp. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that is true. Those are completely unconfirmed rumors, but if they are true, that is certainly a concern. Absolutely. Um, and there's still, even though it swelled very large and now it's, it's, you know, a lot of people have taken off. It's still a pretty big camp. It is very large. There's still thousands of people in camp. Um, yeah. You know, we, we're just kind of waiting to see what happens. Um, you know, uh, as, as part of the Medic and Healing Council, we certainly aren't stopping our work. We certainly aren't stopping what we're doing. Um, so we will see what happens. Uh, but like I said, you know, we're not we're not going to leave. We can't leave. We have to be there for the people when they, you know, as they need us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And ju- just to sort of revisit um, the the our Shambo, um Chairman Archambo, I, I think that he, I mean, he has to work under a system that's messed up to begin with. It's not, it's not an indigenous system. It's tribal governments are a mirror of the parliamentary style government that of the U.S. And so, 
um, it's always going to put a tribal chairman and the tribal council in a situation of a damned if you do and damned if you don't because that's the system that they're working under. So, I mean, I, I actually applaud them for getting as far as they did because it's not only the environmental issues here that um, have been, uh, a light has been shown on it and the, the oil mm -hmm. industries, um, how they just, you know, run roughshod over anybody they want to get what they want, but it's also brought the, the sovereignty issue to the forefront like never before. Right. So that's yes. important. Yep. Oh, it's so important. You know, treaties are the law of the land. Um, and, you know, w those need to be honored. I, everyone says that. Everyone talks about it. But do they really go forward and fight for it? Do they mm -hmm. really make sure that that happens? Uh, you know, there just hasn't been a whole lot of that going on since, probably the 1960s and 70s. That's when people really started thinking about it. Mm -hmm. I remember um, someone telling me about a treaty council that was held on Standing Rock back in like the early 1970s, and it had a huge impact. Uh, thousands of people attended. You know, it was, in, it was actually in the town of Wakbala on the Standing Rock Reservation. But after that, you know, I just I, you just don't hear a whole lot about it anymore, except every once in a while, people saying, hey, we have to fight for our treaty rights. Well, here, people are standing ready, poised to fight for treaty rights, poised to demand that the U.S. government honor those uh, treaties. And, you know, I don't know, there's <laughs> sort of a mixed reaction to it. Right, right. So it, the, the, the no dapple fight continues, and then when when it is all over, the the struggle still continues. It, it's not going to end. Uh, this is just the the current expression of a very long battle uh, for real sovereignty, rather than the paper sovereignty that 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 we're experiencing now. Um, that constantly right. is putting the tribes into. I mean, just. When you look at poverty alone, non-Indians, they don't understand, well, why can't they just use their land? And it, well, because it's in trust, because it keeps getting stolen over and over and over. And now we're looking yeah. at a Trump uh, presidency, and that's the plan, is to take more Indian land for... That for, is exactly the plan. Yeah. Um, for mm -hmm. oil and whatever other resources are in that land. So... This is um, it, this is the time to get radical. <laughs> this is the time to hit the streets and hit the uh, um, you know hit the prairie, like people are doing, and 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 get active. And you know, some of the the major strengths of, of this um, Standing Rock, uh, stand with Standing Rock. You know, um, the whole idea of a water protector. This has. Um, revolutionized our our own idea of what it means to be a warrior when you um right. ha now we have attached to this idea of a warrior somebody who's fighting for mother earth but also somebody who is non-violent that's very new yes right. very much so yeah um yeah i you know <laughs> yeah i think that you know I, a lot of a lot of Native people were raised to be warriors. I, I know one of my own Indigenous friends said that to me uh, yesterday. She said, "My parents raised me to be a warrior." Well, what does that mean? You know, we need to define that, or we need to redefine that. Does that necessarily mean that we go out and we try to physically fight people? That's never really what it meant, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there were always people who were very good at coordination. People who were excellent at negotiation people uh you know we've always been amazing communicators and you know that that is a warrior too and i think you know just as important but i do think that we need people who are willing to you know stand up and 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 not be violent necessarily but stand up and say hey these things need to be recognized right so someone who's willing to be an agitator for instance to get right. in people's face because we, we have a situation where people uh, in America just don't want to mentally deal with reality. We've been fed a bevy of lies for so long 
you know, I saw an interview with Dave Matthews the other day where he's talking about his, his opinion about why this isn't in the mainstream media. I don't actually agree with his opinion about why, but I agreed with him about how um, Americans just won't tune into stuff that doesn't match the narrative that they've been taught. Um, right. So that, yeah. that part is true, but that's not why the media doesn't cover it. You know, so yeah, I agree with. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I agree with you completely on that. Um, you know, you know, while I think that that's an excellent point uh, that, that he was making, mm-hmm. because, you know, um, I, I was talking to a, a, a psychologist and they said that it takes 16 times hearing something 16 times before something in your mind clicks and it becomes truth. And, you know, I think that the narrative that the pro dapple folks, the pro law enforcement, you know, pro law enforcement, I'm not anti law enforcement necessarily, but my gosh, uh, I'm anti brutality. Right. And, um, you know, the, the, the narrative that they are putting out is so filled with blatant lies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those lies have become truth because people just want to believe it. And right. no matter what kind of actual physical evidence we produce, People, you, you know, they always say seeing is believing. Oh, it's not. That's mm-hmm. completely untrue. Seeing is not believing because people can look at a video and see one thing. And yet if someone tells them something that makes them more comfortable, right, less right. afraid, mm-hmm. they will believe that over their own eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about the media blackouts on the Sandy and Rock camps, on the No Dead Apple movement, et cetera. And I happened to come across an amazing article. I don't know if you've read it yet. It was actually in Time Magazine, and it's uh, an Asian journalist named Ed, and, I, and I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, but it's spelled O-U. So maybe okay. it's U or Al. Uh, okay. And he's uh, a journalist who actually tried to go from Canada to the United States to come cover Standing Rock. And I, I encourage everyone to read his article. It's called I'm a Journalist and I Was Stopped from Covering Standing Rock. They basically, uh, at the border, they held him for six hours as they tried to get his phone password rooted through his journal and all of his personal belongings to try to find out where he was going and what he was doing, implying that he was a terrorist because they knew that he was coming down to cover Standing Rock. That is how huge this is to the United Mm. States government. That is how much they do not want anyone uh, coming in and destroying the storyline that they have built up. Right. And this is further proof at how um, the, the Patriot Act is, is not an act to um, protect us from outside aggressors. Patriot Act is an act that allows our own government to do whatever they want to us. It, it, Whatever it's, they want. It's the beginning of what's destroyed, you know, the, the rights that um, we once supposedly had, or at least some of us. Right. Did, you know. Yes. The, um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. The increased militarization, um, you know, the, the increased fascism. It, it, it's the reason that all of this is happening, right? Uh, <laughs> Right. I, you know, you can't you can't make up the stuff that's happening. If we look around the United States, especially, but the world in general, the stuff that's happening, Trump being elected president, you know, increased militarization of our police, uh, uh, people of color being shot down in the street simply mm-hmm. for the color of their skin, absolutely doing nothing wrong. It's it's just it seems like the world has turned upside down and. You know, it's, it's all part of the same problem. That's, that's the thing. Is, you know, we don't have all of these different things to deal with. It's all part of the same problem. Right. And we can, and even those tanks that they roll up in, the, they get them from, from uh, Patriot the government. Act, the government. Yeah. From, they're, yes. you know, <laughs> excess, really excess military. And I, I talk to, yep. to veterans who are coming back from, you know, Iraq who are coming back from Afghanistan, they're like, they're using exactly what we used on the people over there. Exactly. Everything we use that on, on, on people in the, in the streets. So. Yep. And because they're afraid of them, 
You know, it's... Oh, that's me so afraid. You know, how can... You know, it, it boggles the mind how people in a tank that are fully armed can be afraid of people who aren't in tanks and aren't armed. Yeah. You know, that, that boggles the mind. But that is what's so it going does. on. Yes. Well, you know, it, it's very interesting because there I was. This was... Oh, you know, it just wasn't... This was right after they were spraying us in the middle of the night with the water cannons. So I can't, I can't remember the exact date this was. Early November, I'm thinking. Um, but it, or, or when was that, Where they when they sprayed us with the water cannon? 11, 1121, that, that night. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that night. So this was a few days later. And we were standing at the base of Turtle Hill. And up on the top of uh, Turtle Hill, there were, you know, just lines of riot police, you know, armored vehicles. They even had a helicopter up there, you know. It was just crazy. It was, you know, it looked like Iraq on the top of this small hill in the middle of the North Dakota prairie, right? Mm -hmm. A a place where people have, have been buried, a place where people have had picnics, you know, and held ceremonies. Here, all of a sudden, you know, uh, uh, North Dakota state law enforcement um, is is armed to the teeth while people stand at the base in skirts, you know, women in skirts, uh, men in T-shirts and and jackets, uh, you know, looking and and blue jeans, looking up at these riot police, uh, 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 you know, telling them telling them what, uh, you know, what they see in the future, you know, trying to protect our water rights, trying to protect protect treaty rights. And the, the, the cop, one of the North Dakota law enforcement, comes over the loudspeaker and says, hey, young lady, take off your goggles. Wearing those goggles is an act of aggression. Mm. Wow. <laughs> he said Protecting yourself is an act of aggression, <laughs> huh? Yes. That's yes. incredibly yes. interesting. I because I, could, I, I got it on video. I, yeah. I, because I just couldn't believe it. And I... I actually went back through and watched it later because I just couldn't believe that he was implying that protecting yourself is an act of aggression. You know, just the the very act of wearing those goggles, he said, was an act of aggression. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's that's, you know, cluster B stuff right there. I mean, that's right. when you look at psychopaths, narcissists, you know, they all do the same stuff. It's gaslighting and it's also, yeah. um, you know, they... The, the cluster B personalities, you're not allowed to have any boundaries at all with the cluster no. B. So any right. type of boundaries that you have is is an insult to them, is an act of aggression, is um, something to give them narcissistic injury for. So her wearing goggles to protect herself from, um, from the assault that they are laying down on them. Wow, that's cluster B, right? like to a T. Right there. To a T. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And, you know, um, it, it was it was pretty wild to me because I just, I remember uh, people were so angry. Uh, people in North Dakota were so angry when they saw the footage from the night of, you know, December, or I'm sorry, November 20th or so when they were spraying us with the water cannons mm-hmm. in sub-freezing uh, temperatures. And someone saw uh, one of the water protectors pick up a tear gas canister, right? And those things are burning hot after they explode. Right. Picked it up with their bare hands because there it was laying at their feet and they threw it back over the barricade, mm-hmm. right? At, at the at the, the law enforcement. They said that that was, you know, proof of violence on the, on the part of the water protectors. And I just thought it was so funny because they literally expect us to stand there next to an ex- loaded tear gas canister and, and, and just stand there and just and breathe, breathe it in. in. Yeah. Right. That's, and, that's, if we're truly peaceful, we're going to stand there and like breathe it in. I'm sorry. That's not what peaceful means. An instinct kicks in at some point, you know, self-preservation right. is, is a deep rooted instinct, you know, so that's yep. can, and it's, you know, the whole training that, that goes on is, is a training to train yourself out of your own instinct the nonviolent training because our, our instinct is to fight back literally. And so you, right. it takes an incredible amount of self-control not to do that, um, not to literally fight back. Um, and so I right. applaud, I, I applaud water protectors every day 
for their incredible amount of self-control um, that it's taken to, to get to where we're at. And you, and you know that throwing the canister back, um, yes. that's what makes the news. You know, not yes. that's, water that's the only straight thing. in the face, not people's arms getting blown off, but them throwing right. it back. That's exactly right. Yeah. Oh, unbelievable to me. And, and, you know, just so entirely disappointing. I'm so hurt and disappointed by, by, you know, not just law enforcement, because you know, I was, I was raised kind of in, in a family where I wasn't taught to, <laughs> to, to be militant. I wasn't taught to disrespect law enforcement, sure. uh, you know, or that they, you know, I wasn't taught that to be inherently afraid of them. And now I, I see it. You know, I see Mm -hmm. what all of my friends and relatives who grew up on the res, I see what they've been talking about their whole lives, about why they're so scared, about why getting pulled over is is such a scary ordeal for them. Uh, I, you know, I'm scared, too. I I walk down the streets of the town that I live in, and I'm frightened, too. I I drive down the road, um, you know, and, and I know. That, that they know who I am and that they're targeting me because of the work that I'm doing to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline. It's amazing how much they know and, and what the links that they'll go to to protect an oil company. Yeah, and here here we are back again at the entitlement of the oil company to be able to just take whatever land they want. You know, they call it eminent right. domain. Uh, and, and the Yeah, and the whole assumption is that we need... We need oil, so we have to do this. Our our um, our national security depends us on us having this uh, this oil supply, right? Nope. Right. It doesn't. Our national security yeah. depends upon us being able to live uh, on a planet that's not poisoned. Right. Now, that's exactly. the reality of it. Because yeah. when the water runs out, the clean water runs out. You know, and the food runs out, and the animals die. We don't have anything to live on, and, and and like we say in the movement, you you can't drink oil, you know. So yep, that's it's not gonna exactly feed you. right. Yeah, and and you know, um, <laughs> they they keep trying to put forth the idea that this oil is going to somehow um, increase our energy independence, but the Dakota Access Pipeline actually will connect to other pipelines that will take oil out the Gulf of Mexico to other countries. Mm. It, it, it will increase our, it will make our pocketbook more hefty, but it will not increase our uh, dependence. You know, it, it, I mean, our independence, um, uh, it, it, we will still be relying on foreign oil. Right. And, and, it, and it's not going to increase our pocketbook. Sure. No, no. <laughs> it's just the uh, there's, there's people. people who, yeah. Yes. That are yep. that are going to get rich off it, and the entitlement that those three people have to have, um, in order to be like totally cool with destroying life, in order to make that money, it's incredible. Yeah. And when you and when yeah. you look at how unsustainable it is to even use fracked oil to begin with. And I'm talking yes. about the energy it takes to frack that oil, plus the environmental damage. Um, that doesn't even come close to what it gives us in terms of energy. Not even close. Exactly. No, no. Um, yeah, I, I keep talking about this concept of EROI or you know energy return on investment, or some people call it energy returned on energy invested. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember the gentleman's name who was, he's basically written a lot of papers on it. Um, he's actually an economist, an environmental economist, mm. and um, he is an amazing person who basically, you know, has said that we are putting so much energy uh, and so much funding into oil extraction, or, or actually he talks about fossil fuel extraction in general. We're putting so much money, time, energy into that, that the, the rewards that we're reaping from it do not match, right? So, so he breaks it all down to a simple ratio and says that for um, fossil, the fossil fuel industry to be sustainable, it needs to be at a ratio of about, you know, for every one unit of energy we put in, we need to reap about 30 units of energy from that fossil fuel. Well, no, no, no. We are at about... 
you know, fracked oil is at about a ratio of one to three. Mm. Um, tar sands, one to five. Mm. So, uh, you know, we are completely, the fossil fuel industry is completely unsustainable. And, uh, you know, this is actually, they're, they're actually having to borrow a lot of money uh, to sustain that industry. And it's part of the reason for our national debt. Um, if you if you read some of those uh, some of those papers about EROI, you'll see it's just yeah. fascinating. Yeah, and then you you factor in um, the all the cleanups from the 292 oil spills in North Dakota alone. You factor the the cost of that, not just the the, the actual money cost of cleaning it up, but the fact that you never can clean it up. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, I remember seeing photographs from a cleaning up. At, I can't remember which company it was, but cleaning up an oil spill in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was in a neighborhood, so they couldn't exactly dig up all the soil and right. bake it like they usually do, mm-hmm. killing everything. Um, they actually used paper towels. So there were thousands upon thousands of paper towels lying all over this neighborhood. Yep. Uh, to try to clean up an oil spill. It's just ridiculous. They have no clue what they're doing, you, you know, because they're just kind of uh, going off the cuff. They're just kind of playing it by ear. Mm-hmm. Ridiculous. So now we, we're going to get, with the Trump uh, regime, we are going to get ahead of the EPA that doesn't believe the environment needs any protection. Right. Yep. Um Absolutely. And, you know, we the the soon to be head of the EPA, if I remember, is a climate change denier. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that basically so the environment doesn't need climate. protecting, but he's going to run right. the EPA. Right. <laughs> Just ridiculous. Um, and yeah. it's scary. I'm, I'm really yeah. frightened because a lot can happen in four years. Right. A lot mm, can a happen lot. in four years. So. Uh, we, we don't know. We don't know the kind of damage they're going to try to do within the next four years. Um, I, I keep saying that um, I believe that, you know, because it seems like everywhere you turn, the majority of people you meet are not happy with Donald Trump being elected president. Mm. And, you know, there's a lot of people who say the election was rigged and that Russia got involved, things like that. Maybe so. Maybe so. Mm-hmm. But either way. What I think um, is, is a big part of it is that people, the status quo people, you know, uh, our standard white middle class uh, and lower middle class and even upper middle class Americans are afraid. They are so, so afraid of change. And everyone can sense this change coming. You know, uh, you guys talk often about the paradigm shift. Absolutely. Mm. The paradigm is shifting. The world is changing. People are becoming more aware. People are becoming more passionate about the environment. People are seeing the rates of cancer uh, uh, rocket, you know, go, go sky high. Um, people are seeing, you know, thyroid issues, stomach and digestion issues, all because of issues with our environment, certainly breathing issues. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just insane. And, and so, you know, people, people see this happening and, and there's this, slow but sure paradigm shift but there's this you know large sect of the american population that is frightened of that paradigm shift that's in my opinion why donald trump got elected because Mm -hmm. they wanted to elect someone who basically represented 1950 style white male leadership to them and that is who they wanted to put into power and that's what happened right and a narcissist always has a um cult of flying monkeys to do their dirty work <laughs> so they always uh, launch fact-free smear campaigns and um, some you know narcissists like Trump will launch them quite publicly and quite proudly um, but a lot of narcissists do it undercover you know they they do the covert smear campaign the whisper smear campaign about people mm-hmm. fact-free but but uh, and the flying monkeys will will take what the narcissist says as fact with absolutely no proof whatsoever just whatever that narcissist says is fact and then even like you like you were talking about before when presented with <laughs> the facts they still don't exist because there are no right. facts we're in a post post fact um, 
<laughs> regime as well when when Trump takes over, and they're they're very um, proud of that in a way. Oh so, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, being you know being anti science has become you know they they brag about being anti science. They brag about. Uh, you know, uh, being against the facts and, and sort of giggle about it, right? They tweet mm. about how, ha, 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 you know, even though the facts uh, uh, go against what I said, you guys believed me anyway. That's, you know, that's pretty Dude, much every the light. tweet ever. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, um, the light. I, I remember hearing a comedian joke recently about uh, driving a Hummer. And what he said was, oh, you know, driving a Hummer isn't politically correct. And all of a sudden, everyone clapped and laughed and thought it was just so hilarious about how driving this Hummer, you know, was so politically incorrect. And aren't you so cool because you drive a Hummer and, and you know, only get nine miles to the gallon? I just, yeah, <laughs> oh, it's, it's frightening. People like that scare me more, much more than, uh, you know, the the murderers and things I see on TV. It's the, the people who murder with impunity without even admitting it right right and i'm scared for all uh, i'm scared for all america and for women um you know central to this uh to standing rock has been the women the women have been the backbone of the movement have been warriors of this movement and you know of course there's the spiritual connection of um water and women women being the protectors of the water women being um, you know, the sacred chalice, so to speak, um, you know, uh, right. and now, now we're dealing with, um, a regime that's going to come in and take away every single right that we have gained because, um, you know, it's, it's fashionable and cool to hate women as well. Uh, in the, it sa- is, yeah. in the same world that it's fashionable to drive a Hummer and not be politically correct, it's fashionable and cool to um, be hateful and vile towards women just for being women. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, let's, let's joke about basically committing a, a crime, um, you know, uh, touching women against and grabbing women against their, uh, uh, you know, without their permission. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, let's just kind of elbow each other over how funny it is and, and how, oh, look what I get to do, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I get I get to commit sexual assault with like you know, with impunity. Yeah, with with Disgusting. no consequence, and that there no. again is proof of of narcissism because, um, you know, narcissists love that they can they can go beyond people's boundaries, and so that is not locker room talk. People has nothing to do with locker room talk. Locker room talk is guys talking about how sexy so and so is not. You know, right. oh, I raped her. You know, I mean, that's not locker room talk. Normal guys don't talk exactly. like that. They just don't. They yeah. don't brag about their ability to totally discount people's um, boundaries. That's what narcissists and psychopaths do. Right. Let's be clear about. Yeah, that. I, I'm. I, I'm. I'm kind of tired of people trying to make, you know, Trump sound normal. <laughs> right. Yeah. Normalizing <laughs> pathology. Normal. Yeah. And that, he's, that's he's what just it is. not an everyday kind of guy. It's, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, you know, yeah. I, people, people keep saying, you know, oh, warriors aren't afraid. Oh no, I'm kind of afraid. I'm afraid right. uh, for the people. I'm afraid for the next four years. I'm afraid for the future that I want my children to have. Um, but you know, that's not going to, um, that's not going to make me stop. You know, that's not going to make me stop um, uh, being active and taking action on uh, all of these injustices that are happening because the world is unjust right now. There's so much injustice going on. And, I, you know, we can't just sit idly by and let it happen. Yeah. And it, the, the most disturbing part is the rollback and the backlash. So, um, like you're talking about the average everyday uh white American who's scared of this, um, of these changes that are coming, um, scared right. that, you know, they're basically scared that, um, you know, their privilege will be dissolved. Um, but, but here's the thing, uh, that very ignoring of other people 
never having the privilege that you have and the fear that yours will dissolve is exactly what will make yours dissolve <laughs> because right. there, there's only the elite and everybody else and the the elite rely on the 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 middle class white american believing that someday that they will be, make it into the elite they they rely yeah. on that delusion um to <laughs> to elect you know narcissists like trump who, right and then they try to claim that it isn't a, a a racist you know ivory tower by um you know putting forth all of these people of color who have sort of made it to the top uh, I remember a gentleman using Oprah Winfrey as an example. Look, she's a woman and she's black and she's like the richest woman on the planet, you know, mm-hmm. Oprah Winfrey. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I can't help but think that that's all part of the plan, right? right. You know, every once in a while, you have to let one of them through <laughs> in order right. to keep the masses as, as opiate, you know, as, as, as uh, calm as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to, to, to make sense of the argument that, hey, uh, you know, we're we're in a post, we have a black president, we're in a post-racial America, really? Because <laughs> like every other black person doesn't isn't the president. So, and <laughs> and apparently we're never going to have a a female as the president. Not that I supported Hillary because she she stole it from Bernie, and that made me mad. But yeah. um, the 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 whole fake news thing and. Trump appointing his fake news people, you know, to the, to his, um, regime. Uh, that's, that's scary because basically they, the, you know, the alt-right was very successful in, um, convincing people who wanted to be convinced <laughs> that, um, Hillary was going to do exactly what Trump will do. Will do. Right. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Wow. They were, that's an amazing yeah. feat. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, you know, you can you can you can talk badly about them all you want, but they sure they sure were successful. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. I think a lot of people uh, got sucked in to some crazy stuff, uh, and it and it's and it, you know we're in a situation where we rely on alter alternative media because the mainstream media doesn't cover stuff, you know. So and especially in Indian country. The mainstream media has never covered anything that has to do anything with Indians, you know, ever. Yes. <laughs> they just don't because they support the narrative that, you know, natives no longer exist. So they have to keep supporting that narrative, right? Um, of course. Yeah. And so then we have the, the um, native media that springs up to, to so that, you know, we know what's going on in Indian country. Yet, even with the the native media, there's a lot of gatekeeping that goes on, and there's a lot of control of the narrative, which, in some respects, is understandable, because natives don't want their own media controlled by outside sources, right? But it ends up right. it ends up making the 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 news and information that comes out of the native media um, sort of insular, in a way. It does, yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. I, I Don't you always feel like you're preaching to the choir, as they say? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I do because, you know, I, I realize that, that uh, you know, uh, like, for instance, Native America Calling. Who listens to Native America Calling, right. that, that call-in show, uh, besides Native people? Right. <laughs> you know, right. I, I'd love to think that, that, that some policymaker somewhere is listening, but I, I have my doubts. Right. Yeah, so even natives will go to NPR, you know, to to find out stuff, you know, that might not even. <laughs> it's weird. It's a weird situation. So um, it is. It is so odd. <laughs> yeah. So I would say, you know, we have to all become fact checkers on our own. And if you find some yeah. crazy story out there, and there's really no other sources for it, you might wanna kind of doubt it until more information comes out. Don't be so quick. Right. Be like, oh, no, you know, the sky is falling. Uh, <laughs> we have that problem in camp uh, absolutely all the yeah. time, constantly. Uh, you know, people coming in and trying to say, oh, the camp is being raided. I see that on Facebook all the time. And I'm like, no, camp isn't being raided. I- yes. I'm here right now. <laughs> 
Right. Um, but you know, yet, yet we're hearing it all the time. It's it's amazing, and it's amazing with social media how quickly those lies can get mm -hmm. thrown around. Yeah, and that's all part of the co-opting um, thing that both you know Dapple and other sources will will do, and they've been they haven't been real successful with that. Um, I think people have been really good at let, let's get to the truth here and picking sources that they can probably get more accurate information from. Um, again, unless they want to believe the lies, you know, cause there's that issue too. Right. Um, but yeah, I remember there was one person, you know, like shots fired, someone got shot in the head and I was just like, uh, no, no, <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> no, that didn't happen. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, with these terrible storms that we've been having lately, um, all I can think is that these storms are a sign, a continued sign of the, uh, you know, we've always gotten extreme weather in North Dakota, but wow, we've gotten some crazy blizzards over the past few weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, something that, that even, and now these freezing temperatures, it's just kind of weird, you know, it makes me think about co climate change and you know, how we've been warned that, that these storms are going to get more extreme. We're going to have more extreme weather patterns. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the three hours into the first blizzard, you started hearing about, oh, there were four deaths in camp. Four people died. And I just wanted to, <laughs> yeah, I, I probably sweet. wanted to slap those people upside the head because no one died. No mm -hmm. one died in camp. You know, we didn't have a single death in camp. And it was because we have incredible medics who are totally dedicated. Kira, we had medics uh, going around on a four-wheeler all over camp, checking every single structure, making sure that people were safe and warm. For You know, they, they didn't stop. I, I know one, uh, no, two of our medics didn't sleep for 42 hours straight because mm. they were checking on people, making sure that people were safe and warm. Whenever they would find someone who might be questionably warm, you know, they would yeah. uh, make them go to some type of warming structure, a safe place. And, you know, so we have incredible care. Uh, personally, uh, uh, I would be seen by some of our doctors, medics, and healers in camp before I'd be seen by Indian Health Services. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, um, right? Absolutely. Uh, yes. we, have, we have amazing, dedicated people there. And so... Um, we're, we're very, very lucky, but, you know, within minutes, this rumor somehow that somehow, you know, four people died in camp of, of hypothermia, completely false, that just got all over the internet and people were using it against us, trying to say, oh, look at that, everyone really should go home. It just, you know, isn't, it's just not the way that it is. So I, I was more partial to, um, Chairman Frazier's letter. I thought it was nicer how he, you know, really thanked the water protectors. And he was really like, you know, if you're old, if you're in bad health, if you're, you know, you might want to think about, you know, it was more <laughs> not just later, you served your purpose, you know. Um, it was more, <laughs> people like that a little bit more from him. So, um, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the way it is. The people who, you know, who really can't handle this type of weather obviously shouldn't shouldn't stay there right now right this is for the hardcore warriors that can handle this and have you know have the supplies that they need are prepared because it is cold and uh i did want to dispel to dispel another myth the toilets right did go but there's like these compost toilets now um, right, that's correct. Okay. So, um, yeah, the, so uh, the composting toilets are gone. Now, that is not necessarily a bad thing. That is not, uh, you know, we, we the, the folks in the camps weren't all that upset about the, the porta potties leaving because, mm -hmm. in order for porta potties to work in these kind of temperatures, you have to fill them with antifreeze. Mm. Uh, that's terrible for the environment yeah and so we decided that we weren't going to um you know al allow that to happen and so we have a lot of composting toilets that are going going mm -hmm. in now so was that uh patricia arquette's group that helped with building those and getting that together is this yeah. 
Yep, Patricia Arquette's group did help with that. Um, I'm not sure where. I think down those particular ones went in down at Sacred Stone Camp. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I think. I, I'm pretty, fairly sure. So, so um, with the compost toilets, are they fewer and far between <laughs> than, than <laughs> oh, before? Oh, yeah, they definitely... Yeah. <laughs> Yes, very much so, um, and especially now they are they're not up. Um, we do not have as many of them up yet as what we need. Mm. So we're still working on getting um, more of these composting toilets in. It's kind of tough to get out there because it's so cold, you know? Yeah. So it's difficult to get out there and make sure that there are enough composting toilets around. So, uh, you know, there's actually quite a few people who are putting up their own which is uh, perfectly fine as long, you know, as long as they're workable and environmentally friendly. Um, and, you know, and, and we still have to respect the fact that uh, we, you know, there are conditions still being placed on us being there and we want, we don't want to get uh, anybody in trouble. So, <laughs> right. so we're trying to, to work on that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, what, what we really need are people to come in, who can handle the temperatures helped us construct more of these composting toilets. Mm -hmm. People who are able to work four hours a day and be completely self-reliant. Um, and then, you know, they can go home. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, it's tough to work four hours a day in these temperatures. And so if you, you know, if you can't do it, then we really suggest that you don't come to camp. Yeah. And you got to be acclimated for sure to it. You have to. Yeah, yeah, so don't be like flying up from Florida to help out for a few because you're you're just not going to be able to deal with it. You just won't. <laughs> we we had a you know my my husband and I um, housed and two Marines. Now they are incredible people, wonderful guys who brought a big truckload of supplies up for camp. Mm -hmm. uh, it was right in the middle of the storm, and they tried to get up to camp and got about halfway there. From, from where I live, halfway there, and literally slid in their four-wheel drive down a hill backwards. Oh, no. And they, yeah, yes. And, you know, we're, we're talking about two Marines. They're very, very well-prepared physically and emotionally for this kind of thing, but they were not prepared uh, for, you know, the weather. Yeah. <laughs> they just weren't prepared for the weather. And they're from Florida, so, you know, uh, one of them spent – a some time outside and just thought it was incredibly cold and it was it was about 25 degrees that day right yeah. now the wind chill is at about minus 17 oh, so you know 25 oh. degrees isn't even cold so yeah <laughs> oh we're already to the end of the first hour um thank you so much linda and stick around no for problem. tashina we'll talk no soon problem. yep i'm definitely gonna listen to my niece i okay. love her and um, tell her i'm proud of her i will thank you have a good one.